Matthew chapter 17. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, uh, words fail us to express our appreciation for the way you've already moved here this morning. Lord, we're without excuse not to truly worship you. And Father, yet, if we're not careful, left our own conceits, we'll be satisfied with what you've already done and not seek what you're willing to do. So, Father, I pray for the next few minutes you'd help us. I pray that you'd put a hedge about us. I know the devil would like nothing better than to disrupt and distract from what you're doing. So, Father, help us, the Lord, to yield ourselves unto thee. God, speak as only you can speak. Open blind eyes that they may see their need of salvation. God, I pray they'd be saved today. Thank you for the two precious souls saved over at the jail this morning. I pray for those that are struggling, you'd strengthen them. I pray for those that are complacent, you'd revive them. God, I pray you'd do a work in our midst that you alone could get the credit for. And Father, I pray your perfect will be done. Use this unworthy vessel, help us this morning. Say everything you'd have us to say and nothing contrary to your will or your word. And Father, when it's all said and done, we'll bow these unworthy heads one more time and bless you for being so good to us. Use this unworthy vessel. Bless your name. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to a few things from this really astronomical event in Scripture. We find that Jesus takes his inner circle his three disciples, Peter, James, and John, they weren't better than the other three. They were just more connected. Hmm? There's some people say, well, how come God blesses them more than he blesses me? Maybe you need to get better connected. Hmm? But he takes Peter, James, and John high up on a mountain, and notice the transfiguration. In verse number 2 it says, And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. You see, uh, one writer said, The fullness of the Godhead which dwelt in the body of Christ now shone forth. Can I say that Jesus left his throne on high, stepped into the womb of Mary the Virgin, uh, came forth wrapped in flesh, and lived some 30 years to this point uh, in the flesh, uh, and Brother Bob, he stood all he could stand. He couldn't stand no more. Uh, and up there on the mountain, uh, uh, that flesh had to give way to who he was. Sure. Can I say Jesus didn't become God? He was God manifest in the flesh. Hey. He was the God man. Can I say that God is in control of everything? Amen. That includes the elements, the atoms, the protons, the neutrons, uh, it was no problem for him uh, to transfigure this old body of clay into who he was. Uh, 
the glorified Christ, uh, and it was no problem for him to take uh, his old tattered garments he was wearing uh, and turn them into white raiment uh, that sh shined like the sun. It didn't, it didn't affect him at all because he's God. Uh, we see that he was transfigured. Now notice the typology in verse number 3. We find in verse number 3, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, or Elisha, or Elijah, talking with him. That's an amazing thing. We've got the Lord on the mountain, and we've got all of a sudden Moses and Elijah show up. Say, so how'd that happen? God's in control. Hmm? But the typology here is very important. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. And Jesus came in grace and truth. Can I say that when the Father says, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him, what he is saying uh, is uh, the law and the prophets, uh, they give way to Jesus Christ. He came to bring the gospel and a New Testament. Uh, 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 it does not uh, do away with the law and prophets. It enhanced them. It's very important. But there's some other typology here. Moses represents the redeemed who passed through death to the kingdom. Elijah represents uh, 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 those who will pass uh, through translation into the kingdom. Not everybody's going to die. But we all shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, uh, when God shall sound, uh, hey, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then the, uh, those that are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, and so shall they ever be with the Lord. Uh, so we see the typology that is here. There's also some theatricality here. Mm, you say, what is that? Well, look what happens in verse number 4. Then answered Peter. Peter's always popping off at the mouth. Can I say this? Every Baptist church and every Baptist pastor has somebody like Peter. They got more opinions than they got sense. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Well, it was good for them to be here. But then he opens his mouth and puts both feet in it. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias or Elijah. Isn't it amazing that Peter, James, and John knew who Moses and Elijah was? It's kind of amazing to me. But notice the theater here in Peter's life. Uh, can I say that Peter displays an emotional outburst? And if you're not careful, when God gets to doing something, there'll be somebody pop up and say something because they're emotionally excited, but they have no substance to them. That's why we've got to be very careful to discern the Spirit of God and whether or not the Spirit of God wants us to say anything. He wasn't discerning anything. He just popped up and said the first thing came in his mouth. It came in his mind. It came out of his mouth. We see the emotional out, but we see an egotistical display. Look what he says. Let us make three here three tabernacles. He wants to be involved in it. Let me help you something. God don't need any of us. But God chooses to use some of us. Huh? But can I say whether or not we're used of God in any capacity has no reflection on how powerful God is. Hmm? We don't do anything to merit God's favor. God chooses to love us. And He chooses to extend us grace. And He chooses to extend us mercy. We don't deserve any of it. Hmm? But He had an egotistical display. He had an emotional outburst. Uh, and then He had exalted carnality. What He's really thinking, we could say, look what we did. Hmm? Listen, God's never in anything where man's going to get the credit for it. Mm -mm. So we see the theatricality. Then notice the thunder. While he yet spake, 
You know, Jesus didn't even say anything to him. He was so ignorant, Jesus just ignored him. But while he was yet still speaking, popping off the mouth, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. I think the Father put his finger on it. Hmm? Uh, in this verse, we find the presence of God in the bright cloud. We find the proclamation of God. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then we find the prescription from God. Hear ye him. Hmm? And can I say that's still what works today. When we hear what thus saith the Lord. Hmm? Now notice the terror in verse number 6. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. Let me draw your attention. They didn't fall on their face when they saw Jesus transfigured. Now I don't know about you, but if I'm walking with the Lord and the Lord turns into the Lord of glory, it's freaking me out. It didn't them. They were not sore afraid when they saw Moses and Elijah. Elijah sent from heaven and Moses resurrected. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't, it didn't mess with them at all. Seeing is not believing. It was when they heard the voice of God. That's when they fell on their face in terror and were sore afraid. God chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And God's never going to save you by what you see. But it, it amazes me that today, modern Christianity, it's all about what you see. God gave us a book, and it's about what he says. Hmm? Hmm. Notice the touch in verse number 7. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Thank God for his touch. They were fearful until his touch came by. And he says, Arise, be not afraid. And when they opened their eyes, Brother Bob, they didn't see anybody but Jesus. Be a good day in our lives when we get our eyes off everybody else and get our eyes on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now this is a tremendous account in Scripture, and there's a lot more we could say on all of this. But I'm interested, the Bible says, and when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. I'm interested in that verse. I had preach this morning. Now listen to me. I don't want to come across critical, and I do not want to come across cynical. There's been a whole lot said here in the last couple of weeks about this movement going on down at Asbury College, and I understand some of it's extend to other colleges, and there was a, fa a faction that, pro uh, that put something out uh, from NKU where uh, uh, it was there and all kinds of things. Now listen, I'm all for God moving. I'm all for God doing the impossible. I've done a little research in the last couple of days of what's going on down there. And again, I don't want to be critical. I mean, if God's in it, no man can stop it. But there's some things that are happening down there that don't line up with the Bible. Even with that said, the fact that National media outlets are talking about God moving. I say glory to God. But I want to preach with God's help this morning on real revival. You see, what's going on in a lot of these places is what's happening in verse number 4. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, uh, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. A lot of that going on today. Real revival takes place when you see verse 6. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. 
Can I say the word revive is found in the Bible 13 times? And only three times is it dealing with a spiritual awakening. Every time it's dealing with being made alive, being brought back to life. But three times it's dealing with the spiritual awakening. Isaiah 57, 15, the Bible says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth in eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Uh, Habakkuk 3, uh, 2 says, O Lord, I've heard thy speech uh, and was afraid. O, o Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. Uh, in the midst of the years make known in wrath remember mercy. Psalms 85, 6 says, Wilt thou not revive us again uh, that thy people may rejoice uh, in thee? Uh, can I say in order to be revived you have to be alive in the first place? Uh, God does not revive somebody who's never been born again. Uh, uh, somebody that's in dead and trespasses and sins uh, cannot be revived. They've got to be made alive first uh, before you can be revived. Uh, but there are some things that are always prevalent with revival. Uh, whether or not you know it, uh, I've been a student of revival uh, for some 35 years now. Uh, I've read books on real revival. Uh, I've read accounts of men who were there when real revival broke out. Uh, listen, uh, real revival has no true recipe. Now, I know everybody runs 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It's a good starting place. Uh, if my people, uh, which are called by my name, uh, shall humble themselves, pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, uh, then will I hear from heaven, uh, I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. I say hallelujah. It's still in the Bible. Uh, and everybody runs to that as the recipe. Uh, but I've found that God can move whenever He wants to, uh, however He wants to, uh, 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 why, however long He wants to. Uh, uh, God is the one who brings brings revival. Mm -mm. But can I say that throughout all the study that I've ever done on revival, revival always includes several things. Can I say the first thing that you find in revival is you'll find repentance. People will realize they're not what they should be. People will realize they've allowed things to come in their life they shouldn't. People would realize that they've gotten a little cold. They've gotten a little distance. They're not uh, 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 on fire for God anymore. Uh, they'll remember back to when they got saved and they had a zeal and they couldn't wait to get to church. Uh, they, uh, they didn't know the hymns, but they couldn't wait to sing them. Uh, uh, they couldn't wait for preaching. They couldn't wait for fellowship. Uh, and they'll realize they're not that now. And when, when the Spirit of God gets to moving, people start repenting. Mm -hmm. uh, Repentance is simply a change of mind and change of heart towards God. Mm -hmm. What repentance does is it puts things back in focus. Because what happens with time is we get a little out of focus. All of a sudden our attention's drawn in other places. Can I say, uh, everybody in here has a life outside of church. Everybody in here has a life outside of God even though God ought to be the center of our life and uh, sitting on the seat of our hearts and be first place in our life, uh, we let life get in the way sometimes. Uh, uh, listen, you have to work a job. You have responsibilities. God understands that. I understand that. Uh, but the problem arises when those things take precedence over God. Matthew 6, 33, still in the Bible. But seek ye first King God, His righteousness, all these other things. Added. We want all the other things, and then Christ comes later. Hmm? Doesn't work that way. And real revival brings repentance. Folks realize that they've gotten out of focus uh, and they have a change of heart and change of mind towards God. And they'll repent. Uh, now there's a lot been said about Asbury about repentance. Listen, when repentance happens, there's a change. You don't stay the same. Mm. You don't come and say a prayer and shed crocodile tears and go right back doing the exact same thing that you supposedly repented of. You uh, understand that what you're doing has disappointed God and it breaks your heart uh, and you ask God to forgive you and you ask God to give you the grace not to get back in that shape. Uh, I've got a problem with what I see out of all that. They supposedly repent. But there's no change. 
If there is no change, there is no repentance. Can I say, secondly, that real revival brings reverence. Look again at verse number 6. I know you're getting mad at me, but I really don't care. When disciples heard it, what did they do? They fell on their face. Is that what it said? When they came face to face with God, where did their face end up? They bowed before Him. They reverenced God. Now again, when Jesus transfigured, they didn't reverence Him. That's why Peter popped off at the mouth. But when they heard the voice of God, they fell on their face. Hmm? Now there's been a lot that I've seen in these videos coming out of this deal where they supposedly are in revival, they supposedly have repented, but I see men in a so-called sanctuary with ball caps on. I see half the crowd with their phones out videotaping everything. Hmm? I don't see them smitten prostrate before God. Listen, I'm not the brightest light bulb in a bunch, and I realize a lot of them have not been raised in church, even though they're going to a so-called Christian college. But I learned a long time ago, you don't wear a ball cap in the house of God. My mama, as a matter of fact, today would have been my mother's birthday. Uh, my mama would drag me to church. I played ball on Saturday. We had church Saturday night. A lot of times we had a late game. I come in my uniform, my head a sweaty, moppy mess. You think I wore a ball cap in church? No, 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 no. Didn't happen. Paul would have knocked my head off. Yeah, he would have. Huh? Had enough respect for the house of God. You didn't wear a ball cap in the house of God. Go look at the videos. Half the, half the young men in there got ball caps on, wearing shorts, and acting like the world. There hasn't been no change. There's no reverence. Therefore, it's not revival. Say, Brother Doug, you're being judgmental. No, I'm just telling you. When they come face to face with God, they fell on their face. Can I say this too? We watched a video of some of the music going on. And the crowd reacting to the music looked like a rock concert or country concert. They were jumping up and down and shouting to the singers, and the singers were shouting to them some kind of chant. Can I say chanting is always found in devil worship? Never in godly worship. Again. If it's of God, it's not going to look like the world. Not going to sound like the world. It would reverence God. Miss Nett and I listened and listened and listened, could never figure out what they were saying. All I know one thing is it wasn't lining up with my spirit. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. And there's a kindred spirit. I can be around somebody for a very short time and know if my spirit lines up with them. Huh? But my spirit wasn't lining up with whatever songs they were singing. Hmm. Now, if I'd have been in a fleshly spirit, I'd have liked it. Because it does appeal to the flesh. But that inner man who wants to reverence God didn't line up with it. Say, Brother Doug, you're being critical. No, I'm just trying to let you know real revival brings reverence, brings repentance or change. It brings resignation. It brings obedience. If somebody truly repents and reveres God, they'll be obedient to God. They'll, they'll do what God says to do in the Word of God. They'll want to please God. You know who doesn't want to please God? People not right with God. Huh? Can I say this? There'll be a rapport. You say, what do you mean with rapport? I mean unity. I mean oneness. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? 
Now this movement going down there, you got Catholics, you got Presbyterians, you got Methodists, you got some Southern Baptists, you got some uh, uh, Baxley Independent Baptists, you got all kinds of flavors down there. But the Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Acts 2, 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were, with all, uh, they were all with one accord in one place. In order for there to be revival, the crowd must worship the same deity. How could there be revival when some are praying to Mary and some are praying to Jesus and some are just praying to some God out there? Huh? Can I say this? They'll have the same doctrine. How can they have revival and some believe that you've got to be baptized in order to be saved and some believe you've got to take a, a, a wafer in order to be saved and some believe this and some believe that? Listen, now, we may not believe it all exactly the same, but there are some principal doctrines you must believe. Uh, how can they have revival when they don't even believe the Word of God is the Word of God? Why do you think I don't go to all these... Uh, 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 prayer breakfasts that the city council puts on because I don't believe like a lot of these people I don't believe like they believe at uh, Seven Hills and at Crossroads and all. they don't believe the book that's the end of discussion mm, I have nothing to say to them uh, I don't believe in a second blessing I believe I got filled with the Holy Ghost when I got saved I don't believe in speaking in tongues. I can't even speak English, let alone any other languages. And the only unknown tongue there is is a language that I don't understand. Mm. There's resignation, there's obedience, there's rapport, there's unity. You've got to have the same deity, same doctrine, but also the same desires, the same spiritual goals and aspirations. And it's always this, to God be the glory. Sirs, we would see Jesus. It's always uh, whatever Jesus wants. He must increase, I must decrease. Hmm? Can I say this? As a result of revival, there will always be regenerations. Folks will get born again as a result of revival. Hmm? Because uh, lost folks will see what saved folks uh, should have been all along. They'll see the, the work of God in them, and God draws sinners, and sinners get saved as a result of revival. Huh? You don't have revival to see people saved, but as a result of revival, there will be people saved. Can I say, as a result of revival, there will be rejoicing? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. People get excited when God gets to moving. The problem with all that down there, they got all the excitement, but it's all based on the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Listen, I know, I know, done, done upset somebody. Ray, are you upset? Okay, good. Brother Ron, I keep hearing about this movement. Can I help you all with something? Woodstock was a movement too. Hmm? Just because you got a movement don't mean it's a movement of the Holy Ghost. Hmm. Now again, I hope it's real. But I haven't seen any evidence that it's real. I'm all for, just like at Christmas time, I'm all for Christmas because the world has to take account of all the Christmas carols and everything that's going on that Jesus came. And I'm all for the Lord getting some, some you know, airwaves and people talking about the Lord. But I'm just here to say, I haven't seen a whole lot of evidence of real revival down there. If we're going to get down to the brass tacks of it, it's been well over 120 years since real revival came to America. When America became prosperous, America realized it didn't need God anymore. And that's why you got Bozo in the White House. People no longer pray and seek God's face. As long as we can watch sports, as long as we can work a job and pay our bills, we don't need God. I heard a man say 20 years ago, sports was the most important thing in America. You know what? He's right. Say amen. Hmm? Say, so I don't believe that. God's most important. Then how come you miss church to go to sports? Hmm? Boy, that really killed it right there. It's true whether you believe it or not. 
Some of you just need to get revived. Real revival. We'll bring remaining. There will be a continuance. Most of y'all, Friday night when the preacher leaves, your revival's gone. Real revival remains long after the preacher. Matter of fact, the fruit of revival starts after the preacher's gone. Hmm? You know why so many churches have to book preachers that everybody likes a year or two years in advance to get him? Because you think revival's with him. Hmm? I find usually revival breaks out when there's a no-name preacher around. Hmm? Uh, the Lord was trying to do something here in Sunday school this morning. What we had in Sunday school was real. And friends, can I say, anything less is not acceptable. We desperately need revival in America. We need revival in our church. Life has gotten away, and so many people are facing so many heartaches and hardships. We need God to move. Hmm? You know you're revived when you can't wait to get to church and you don't want to leave. You know you're revived when it doesn't matter what the preacher preaches, you're all in. You know you're revived when it doesn't matter who sings and what they sing, you're all for it. You know you're revived when you want to do something for God more than you want to do something in the world. You know you're revived when God gets your pocketbook. Two people amen on that. I knew they'd get them. Huh? See, when God gets your heart, He gets all of you. What we need is an old-fashioned, heaven-sent, sin-killing, devil-chasing, real Holy Ghost revival. And can I say, it's only one prayer away. He says, you have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, you ask amiss because you want to build tabernacles. When you ask God, God, revive me. God, I'm the one. I'm a little cold. I'm not where I once was. God, I'm not as excited as I once used to be. God, I look for excuses instead of looking for you. When you get to praying, God, I just want you more than my next breath. You're subject for revival. I wonder this morning, when there's no press and there's no notoriety and there's nothing but just us here today are you willing to ask God for revival because it starts with us if my people are you willing wilt thou be revived Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Mother, come, let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, I just want something real. And Lord, if what's going on down at that college is real, I say amen. Lord, I haven't seen any evidence of it, but you see all things. Lord, if it's not real, I still pray that you'd use that as a springboard of folks having a real revival. God, I pray you'd do work around here. We need revival. Lord, I need revival. I need a touch. I need your presence. I need to hear the voice of the Lord. Lord, help us. Lord, do for us what we can't do for ourselves in revival. Lord, we long for it, we pray for it, we preach for it. Lord, help us to have it. Lord, we know the nighttime cometh when no man can work. 
We know your imminent returns in hand, and yet so many aren't ready. God, send revival. Help folks get ready for the second coming of the Lord. Bless down this invitation. Speak to hearts. Help us to repent. Help us to reverence you. Help us to have something real. We'll bless you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.